Amen. We are in the book of Isaiah. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got some Bibles lying around. We have not been in a prophetic book in a little while. The last half dozen Wednesdays or so, we've been talking about prophecy because if you talk about the history of Israel, you really can't avoid talking about the future history revealed in prophecy, but we haven't gone through a prophetic book per se. So before we dive into chapter one, let's talk a little bit about what we mean when we say a prophetic book. And, and to talk about prophecy is almost always, no, it is always to talk about the history of Israel because the history of Israel is the history of a nation that brought forth the Messiah the Christ, Jesus, and all significant prophecy in Scripture speaks of Jesus. So, so let's, let's recap the recap that we did when we did the recap a few weeks ago and talk about Israel. When we talk about Israel, we're talking about the nation that came out of Abraham. 2100 B.C. or so, God the Father said to Abraham, come out of your father's house to a land that I'll show you. And Abraham beget Isaac, beget Jacob. That takes us up to 1850 B.C. or so. Going super fast because this is the review of the review. Uh, then Joseph, Jacob's son, leads, well, Jacob was still with them, but together they, they, they take shelter from famine in Egypt. In 1446 or so, B.C. obviously, Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. 1405, after a few laps around the wilderness, Joshua leads the children of Israel back into the land. And beginning in 1400 or so, we have the time of the judges, where there was no one leader over Israel, but a, a series of regional leaders, if you will, judges. 1050, Israel says, we want a king like all of the other nations have kings. And so they got Saul. And we read about Saul in 1 Samuel. 1003 BC, David consolidated his rule over all of Israel. He had had pieces of it up until that point. 1003, David is accepted as the ruler over all Israel. That's 2 Samuel. 1070, Solomon takes the throne after David's death. And 40 years later, in 930, and this is where we'll slow down, the kingdom splits. Rehoboam takes the southern kingdom of Judah, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, and splits off from the northern kingdom under Jeroboam. And we know, most of us, what happens from there. The northern kingdom goes from bad to worse and is overrun by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The northern kingdom does a little bit better, not a lot better, but a little better. They have some good kings. They have some times of revival. They hang on until they're overrun by the Babylonians in 589 BC. And when we were going through this more slowly, we, we acknowledged that there were a series of Babylonian invasions and a series of exiles, the, 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 the ultimate one, the final one in 589. What does this have to do with prophecy, Patrick? As this history unfolded, God found it necessary, found it appropriate to speak to his people Israel with greater frequency, with increasing urgency. How? Through the prophets. What's a prophet? It's, it's easiest to think of it this way. Maybe not perfectly accurately, but easiest to think uh, the priests spoke to God for the people through worship and through sacrifice. And the priests were also the stewards of God's word to the people. But when God had something to add to the law, he spoke through the prophets to the people. Now before Moses, those roles, priest and prophet, were a little blurry. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they really, at different times, you can find each of them performing both functions. Abraham especially, we find functioning as a priest, although Isaac and Jacob did as well. Jacob probably prophesies more than the other two put together. There's, all three do both roles at different times. But when God gave the law to Moses, and with it, the plans to the tabernacle, and with that, instructions on how he desired to be worshipped, the priesthood was established, and the role of the priests was codified. And at that point, the need for prophecy should have diminished. I'm sure there still would have been some. After all, God began prophesying all the way back in Genesis 3.15, when he spoke 
first spoke of a coming Messiah. And he gave us more detail about the identity of that Messiah through Abraham and through Isaac and, and through Jacob. But once the law was given, once the priesthood was established, once worship was set up, if Israel had obeyed, if Israel had walked in the ways that God established for them, God probably wouldn't have had a lot to add. But we know it didn't work out that way. Almost immediately, the people began to slip away from God. We don't get out of the book of Numbers before they're slipping away from God. Pushing the boundaries on their relationship with God. At times, ignoring it altogether. And so we see God raising up generation after generation of prophets to rebuke Israel. Hey, not like that. To exhort Israel. Hey, more like this. To encourage Israel. I love you, but you're getting it wrong. The first, and I might be wrong about this, correct me if somebody knows better, but I think the first of the prophets after Moses is probably Deborah. Interesting that she was a woman. As the priesthood began almost immediately to, to, to compromise, in some cases to just abdicate and, and abandon their roles, God began to speak through individuals, and he continued to speak through individuals that he raised up, that he put his Holy Spirit upon, all the way through Malachi. At which point, of course, God, as far as we know, fell silent. The 400 years of silence before Jesus. But that's 700 years of prophecy. And within that 700 years, we see tremendous variety in the people that God raised up and the ways that God used them. At times we see groups of prophets living together in communities. We see schools of, of the prophets being trained up, but we also see prophets in total isolation. We see prophets enjoying favor, living in the king's court, prophets that are heard and, and honored. We also see prophets that are ostracized, ridiculed, attacked, even put to death. We see prophets doing their ministry in and around the temple at times, but we also see prophets at the other end of the nation and even in exile. We see prophets come to their ministry sometimes through education, again, schools of the, of the prophets, through preparation, through discipleship and mentoring. Others, God just comes upon them. And, and, and with no warning or provocation, they're dreaming dreams and they're having visions. Some prophets, the, the, their ministry lasted days, perhaps. Others prophesied for decades. Isaiah is, is one of those. With all of, the, all of this variety, though, again, the role of the prophet in God's eyes becomes more and more prominent over time. Why? Because Israel, and then the divided kingdom of Judah and Israel, declines more and more over time. They go from a nation called out by God, set up by God, established by God, dedicated to God, a nation that pledged themselves to God under Moses, more and more and more and more and more turn away from God. And after 930 B.C., which again was when the kingdom divided, the role becomes so important that the writings of some prophets get, get well, the, the, the utterances, I should say, of some prophets, the prophecy of some prophets, gets written down and it gets included in Scripture. What Jesus, when Jesus speaks of the law and the prophets, he's speaking of the written word of those prophets whose words were weighty enough, substantial and significant enough that God said, yeah, this isn't just for this time and this people and this place. This, this is transcendent. Write it down, because this is, this is going to have things to speak to people for generations to come, for centuries to come, to you and me tonight. Of those written prophets, those who prophesied before the respective exiles of Israel and Judah, three prophesied to the nations. God raised up three prophets whose, whose target audience was outside Israel and Judah. Jonah, Nahum, and Obadiah. He raised up just two prophets to prophesy to the northern kingdom, Amos and Hosea. Six, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, prophesied to the southern kingdom. Why that, that disproportionality? I'm not sure that's even a word. Why more to the south than to the north? 
Well, think about how they were founded. The north immediately set up false worship. They immediately abandoned the temple and worship at the temple. They set up golden calves again. How do you repeat that mistake? But they did. And, and so they had no hope. They had no, if you'll pardon the expression, prayer of, of, of succeeding as a nation dedicated unto God. They, they never had any intention of being. The southern kingdom at least had the temple, had the priesthood, had some good kings, and so God had more words of exhortation for them. There was more hope, more likelihood, more reason to believe that they might come back to him. But both to the north and the south, from time to time, God sent prophets, spoke to the people beyond the law, spoke to the people about himself, spoke to the people about themselves, and spoke to them more than anything about the relationship that was going on between himself and themselves. The relationship that they were having, the relationship that they were having right then and there at the time that the prophets were speaking, and the relationship that he saw emerging, the trend that he saw developing, the forecast, if you will. Here's where things are headed. Think back again to Moses. Under Moses, Israel entered into the Mosaic Covenant, right? And we read the long form of it in Deuteronomy 28, but the short form, obedience begets blessing. Disobedience brings judgment, chastisement. So as we open Isaiah tonight, God is giving a report card based on those two, that, 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 that simple evaluative criteria. Are you obeying me? Are you walking in my ways? And if we think in terms of Isaiah prophesying in 70, 740 B.C., that's when he begins. How do we know? Because in chapter 6, he's going to say that his ministry began the year that King Uzziah died. And we know that that was in 740 B.C. How's Judah doing by the time we get to 740 B.C.? A couple hundred years after the kingdom divides. Good? Not good? Not so good. Not so good. Not in danger of imminent disaster. 740 B.C., they're less than 20 years away. The northern kingdom is less than 20 years away from being wiped out by the Assyrians. Southern kingdom is doing better, still not doing very good. Because after Rehoboam, let's, let's, let's review kings here, they had, they, they had Abijah. Rehoboam, not a good king. Abijah, not a good king. Asa, Asa was a good king. And they had 40 years of a good king, but then they had three bad kings in a row. And then Joash and, and, and Amiah, I'm sorry, Amaziah, they were, they were pretty good. Uzziah, quite good. But after that, they start having more bad kings than good kings. So what is God who is outside of time and watching all of this unfold? What does God know? He knows you're not doing as well as you think you're doing now. And if you keep going the way that you're going, you're going to be doing a lot worse pretty soon. All, all, all of which is a long way of saying, Judah's not doing great. They're not walking in the ways of the Lord, and they're not walking as closely with the Lord as they think they are. The kings are not always faithful. The priests are lukewarm at best. And the people aren't faithful. As the priests go, so the people go, right? And as the kings go, so goes the nation. Groups take on the qualities of their leaders. So for Judah, things are not very good, and God's going to say that. But he's also going to remind them that he is good. God is always good. And because he's good, Habakkuk 3.2, even in judgment... God remembers mercy, and he's going to say that tonight as well. So, a little bit of context. We'll fill in more as we go. we got 66 chapters, so we can keep adding context. We'll have plenty of opportunities, but that's probably enough to get us going. Chapter 1. We said that Judah's report card is not good, and God isn't going to sugarcoat it. 
He's not going to do one of those, you know, management techniques where he finds some good things to say before he like, brings the hammer down. No, he gets right to it. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. This is a vision that, that, that extends beyond chapter 1. The word here for vision is, is the entirety of what God reveals to Isaiah. So all 66 books in scope here, which are going to be spoken to him from 740 when he begins to, to 680 or so when he wraps up his ministry. This is a long ministry that Isaiah has. Verse 2, what does God have to say? How does he open his message to Israel through Isaiah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I've nourished and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. The, the idea here, and you probably you know, glean this, it's a courtroom kind of a motif that Isaiah's going for. That's, that's really common in the prophets. The idea of, of, a, of a prosecuting argument and a defense argument, common in the prophets, common in Paul's writing. We're used to it um, from, from our Sunday studies because Paul lapses into that quite often. So, so the idea here is, hear ye, hear ye, court is in session. And the jury is who? Pretty much the whole universe. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. You're going to be witnesses. You're going to, you're going to sit in judgment of what I have to say. The defendants, God's children, Judah and her capital, Jerusalem, what's the charge? They're rebellious. They don't show God the gratitude that God is due. In fact, they don't show God the gratitude that pets and farm animals show their owners. What's the joke? What, what's the difference between a dog and a man? If you pick up a starving dog and feed him, he won't bite you. That's, that's, that's kind of what God is saying here. And, 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 you know, we're sympathetic to the defendants, right? We feel a kinship with them. So, so we might say, God, have you tried correcting them? Have you, have you clarified your expectations? How's the communication? Have you tried punishing them at home? Have you tried something, you know, administrative before dragging them to court? Bah, huh? Says God. Yes, I have. Verse 4, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. Forsaken in the sense of they're not likely to go back. They've provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They've turned away backward 180 degrees from the course that God set for them. So why should you be stricken again? Here God addresses the defendant directly. You'll just revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faints from the sole of the foot even to the head. There's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Yeah, we started dinner tonight. <laughs> it's good planning. They've not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. God is saying, I've chastened them. I've chastised them. And he's speaking here in the future, what we sometimes call the prophetic past tense. He's speaking about future events as if they've already happened. He's saying, I'm going to drive Judah to the brink. What's he talking about? He's talking about an evasion of the Assyrians that's going to happen in 701 BC. That's going to leave the land ravaged. Again, it hasn't happened yet, but God sees the future as if it's already happened. And he's saying, look, I'll, 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 I, I have punished them. I'm going to punish them. But I can tell you, because I'm God, nothing is going to change. And at some point, doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results, that's just insanity and God's not insane. Verse 7, your country is desolate. Again, he's looking in the future on the other side of that 701 invasion. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land and your presence. That's the Assyrians. And it's desolate, is overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. 
God is, is, is using the voice of Judah to make his point. He's saying even they should realize if it were not for God's mercy, there wouldn't be a conversation to be had here. Were it not for God's mercy, the Assyrians would have finished them. Except for God's intervention, Assyria would have wiped them out. But I, but I put the brakes on, says God. I didn't judge them, this is important, I didn't judge them like I judged Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the outcome when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah? Annihilation. Wipe them out. I didn't do that. I'm not going to do that, says God. I'm going to chasten them. I'm going to punish them. But I'm going to leave a remnant. Now, verse 10 gets a little confusing. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Solomon. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Wait a minute. I thought we just said that God wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah, that they were annihilated, that they were extinguished in judgment. Why is he talking to them? He's not. He's speaking to Jerusalem. He's speaking to Judah, who are acting like Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's characterizing them that way. If you call someone... If, if, if someone is betraying you, acting like a traitor, you might say, you Judas, you Benedict Arnold, you. It's in that same sense that he's calling Judah, you Sodom, you Gomorrah, you out and out rebel. To which Judah says, who us? Moi? How so? God says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? I've had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I don't delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Judah says, God, we don't understand. Why are you mad? We're worshiping. Every day we're worshiping. Every day we're sacrificing bulls and goats and doves. We're keeping the feasts. We're observing the Sabbath. Yes, yeah, says God, and I hate it. Everything that you're doing, all of the, the ways in which you're, you're walking through your observance of the law, I hate all of it. What's the purpose of it? I've had enough of it, verse 11. When you come to appear before me, verse 12, who's required this from your hand to trample my courts? Stop it. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates their trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What God just did is go line by line through his instructions to them. All of the things that he asked of them. All of the things that the law required of them. God says, yeah, you're doing it. Sort of. Kind of after a fact. And, and the more you do it, the more offended I am. Why? What does God hate more than anything else? Who does, who does Jesus reserve his harshest indictment for? The hypocrites, yeah. The people who claim to worship him, but even as they do, misrepresent him. God cares about the heart way more than he cares about the hands. And if the actions, even actions that he's prescribed, don't come from a heart of worship, God says that's useless. It's worse than useless. It's insulting. I remember this is years ago in another church in another state, but uh, parents brought, brought a youth in to the office, young, young teen who had gotten caught up in pornography. And they said, you, you gotta, you, he's got to stop. You got to make him stop. Make him stop. Make him stop now. You got you to gotta, you gotta get him out of this. You gotta. I, I said, okay, well, you guys go get coffee or something and, and we'll talk. And we talked for a while, and it was a good conversation. My parents came back. Okay, did you, did you fix them? <laughs> and I said, we had a good conversation. Well, okay, so, so he's going to stop watching, looking at pornography. I said, probably not. What do you mean? That's why we brought him here. I said, he's not ready for that yet. Oh, so you're fine with him sinning? I said, I'm not fine with him sinning. 
But if, 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 if we somehow magically could, could reach in and, and, and pull pornography out of his life, which in the 21st century, I'm not sure how you do that. You, you, you can put up hedges, but hedges work exactly as well as people want them to work. Even if we could do that, I said there wouldn't be any heart change because he hasn't decided what he thinks about Jesus. And if I were successful extracting pornography from his life, what would we have but a porn-free person who hates Jesus? I said, well, we're going we're to take a little bit of a longer road, but I think it's going to be a better road. We're going to keep talking about God. Because if somebody falls in love with God, if somebody gives their life to Jesus and means it, if somebody invites the Holy Spirit into their soul, that pushes the appetite for sin out. That drives the desire for sin away. I've used the example before. You put a couple ounces of, of sewage in a 55-gallon water barrel. Do you want to drink the water? No, but how do you get the sewage out? You get it out by pouring in more and more and more clean water. Jesus said, come to me, I'll give you living water. I'll put a pump of water in the middle of your barrel. And it'll purify everything. Until then, we're just trying to fish sewage with our hands. And, and God is saying to Israel, look, you can go through the motions. You can, you can fake it all you want, but you can't fake it till you make it, not with God. What Israel needs to do, I, I, okay, disclaimer. Over the next year of our lives, I'm going to say Israel a lot when I mean Judah. Can I ask for your grace one time in advance? <laughs> What God tells Judah she needs to do, verse 16, is wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. In other words, come back to me. Come back to me. Repent of the way that you're going and return to my heart, and let my heart be your heart, and let my heart drive your choices and your actions, which are going to go far beyond the requirements of the law. If you come back to me and let my heart be my, your heart, the thing we're going to get to do together, the thing that you're not doing even a little bit right now, we're going to love. Come back to me so we can love. That's what he says when he says wash. Make yourself clean. He's not pointing at the ritualistic kind of cleaning that the priests would indulge in because he's already said it's not about that. No, he's saying repent. He's saying acknowledge that you're filling your head with stuff that has nothing to do with me. What happens when they do? Verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your skins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And we recognize that that is the gospel. That's the promise of forgiveness right there in the Old Testament. That's God offering divine cleansing for those who are willing. For those who will turn away from their wickedness and say, God, your plan was the best plan all along. Can we start that again? Can you revive us again? God's offering Judah an alternative. You've heard of alternative sentencing? This is alternative sentencing, only, only better. Because Judah's guilty. There's, there's no, no way around it. No reasonable being would argue otherwise. It's, it's, you know, God has moved on from presenting his case because it's a foregone conclusion. Judah can keep pretending that they're not guilty. They can keep denying the charges. They can keep professing their innocence, but really, what's the point? They can keep practicing their religion, pretending everything's okay, or, and this is what God is urging them to do, they can throw themselves in the mercy of the court and let God cleanse them and reorder their minds and reprioritize their lives. If you do that, God says, what will follow is good. Go back to verse 17. What will follow is goodness and justice and freedom for the oppressed and mercy for the poor. I'll teach you those things, God says, verse 17. I'll lead you in those things. And you and I know from our conversations on Sunday, God will go further. He'll empower us in those things. But the first step is repent. 
The first step is admitting that's not already who you are. The first step is acknowledging that's not what I'm currently doing. The first step is, is, is professing, yeah, that's not our relationship right now, God. I've been pretending that it is, but it really isn't. Repent, God says. Repent in verse 18, ask forgiveness, and then we can do stuff together. But it's your choice. Verse 19, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And that's just the Mosaic Covenant all over again. Obedient begets blessing. Disobedient, judgment. Your, your choice, God says. Judah has a choice. Sadly, we know the choice that she's going to make, and so does God. Verse 21, how the faithful city has become a harlot. This is where they're going to end up. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your sin, uh, silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They don't defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. The picture is that nothing is good anymore. Everything is corrupted. There's nothing left that's not polluted. But, but the worst indictment is the first one. And it's easy to miss. Go back to verse 21. I, I want to I make sure we notice the gravity of what God is saying. The faithful city has become a harlot. And it's not explicit here, but if we lateral to Hosea and other passages, how does God view Israel? Israel taken all together. The nation, the people, God also sees as his bride. Yeah. We're the bride of Christ. Israel is the wife of Jehovah. And that wife has become, verse 21, unfaithful. She's, pro yeah, she's prostituted herself to, to idols, to false gods. She's embraced unrighteousness as opposed to godliness. Love of justice has been replaced by selfishness. Full of people who hate. Isaiah says murderers, but what does Jesus do? He equates the two. You hate someone, you've murdered them in your heart. God is saying, you're not my bride. I don't recognize you anymore. You're not the people I married. Therefore, verse 24, therefore God says, I got to do something. The Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I'll rid myself of my adversaries. I'll take vengeance on my enemies. I'll turn my hand away from you. I'll thoroughly purge away your dross. I'll take away all your alloy. I've used an example before when my daughter was, was a, a, a little, little and playing little, little kid soccer. And little kid soccer is the best because it, it's basically just this mob of girl that, that, that moves like in an amoeba-like fashion up and down the field. And every once in a while, the ball pops out of, of this mob and then one girl sprints after the ball and then all the girls sprint after that girl. And, you know, about a third of the time, they're going the wrong way, which is where parents become a very important part of the action. Because the ball pops out, the girl goes after the ball, everybody else goes after the girl, and there's dad saying, no, the other way, you're going the wrong way, turn around. And it's the cutest thing when they're like three and four and five. It really is. It starts to be less cute when they're six or seven or eight because you're yelling at your kid other way other way and the other parents are looking at you okay you're hurting the team now a little bit but you know it's my kid so the other way and then when they're nine or ten or eleven well there comes a point where you can't put up with it anymore if you've if you've taught your your son or daughter this is the way you go and if you've practiced going the way you're supposed to go, and you've even said, look, if, if you get to the ball and you don't know which way to go, look at me, I'll point. And, and, and your son or daughter still doesn't go the right way. It's time to take them off the field. And, you know, if, if, if that were to happen to me, you know, it would, be, it would be with a father's heart grieving I really wanted this to be a good game for you. I really wanted this to be something we could do together. I wanted you to enjoy this. I wanted you to, to, to make the, your other teammates better and have fellowship with them, but 
th th clearly this isn't for you. And it's with that kind of heart that God says, I got to do something. Because if I leave you on the field, people are going to think I don't care. People are going to think I don't notice. People are going to think that I'm okay with you dragging the other people down, the other team down. So I got to do something. And God says, verse 24, I've got to do something. Now I can imagine as, as Isaiah is, is, is saying, I'll rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance of my enemies. I, I can imagine the people of Judah saying, okay, God's going to push back Assyria. It's about time. I'm tired of them breathing down our neck. No, no, Judah. <laughs> the enemy is you. I'll turn my hand against you. Verse 25, we've met the enemy and he's us. That title, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, those are military terms. God is bringing the force of his might against his people. I was at the East Coast Pastors Conference last week and we sang, I don't, do we sing the song Mighty Warrior here? It's one of those things, we sang it a couple times in the conference, now I can't remember if I learned it there, or if I, but, but the, the lyrics are your God, our, sorry, our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory we reign, we triumph in your name. And I'm a little ambivalent about the song. I mean, it, it goes on and it talks about Jesus who, who is fighting our battles. I mean, the, the, but if you just, our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. Listen to where this goes. Skip down to verse 28. The destruction of transgressors and sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed, for they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired. You shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you've chosen. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tinder, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. Yeah, our God is a consuming fire, and when that turns against his people, that's a, that's a terrifying and awesome thought. Terebinth trees, by the way, were, were the, the sites of pagan worship and often symbols of pagan worship to, to Baal and other gods. God's saying, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going I'm to I'm burn them with my consuming fire. The altars, the places of false worship, and look at verse 30 and 31 again. God says, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to burn you to the ground, your land, your children, your culture. The picture is, is, is Israel's false worshipers will be burned on the altars that they've erected to false gods. That's sobering. Is that literally what's going to happen? No, but that's the picture. The idea is that their false worship and the fruit of their false worship have sealed their fate. But not completely. Not entirely. Not forever. Go back to verse 26. I'll restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice, and her penitents, those, those who are, 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 confess their sin, with righteousness. What's on the other side of this great judgment? Mercy. Throughout this book, 66 chapters, God is going to continue to speak in these dramatic, apocalyptic terms about his judgment against Judah. And again and again, he's going to underline, she deserves it, and she does. And when he describes it, it's never anything other than devastating sweeping, comprehensive destruction. But listen, never annihilation. Never going to wipe them out altogether. Why? Because in his judgment, God remembers mercy. God always leaves a remnant. 589 B.C., he's going to leave a remnant to return and rebuild. Jerusalem, the temple, the walls. 70 A.D., driven from the land. But 2,000 years later, the wandering Jews returned. And for 70 years have, have been anchored again on the land. And in the future, in the future, we read in Revelation, two-thirds of the Jewish people will be wiped out during the tribulation. 
but God will preserve a third. Because that remnant, from that remnant, will be those that call upon his name. And when they do, Jesus returns and verses 26 and 27 are fulfilled. Don't let anyone tell you that those verses have already been fulfilled, that, that they were fulfilled after Cyrus said, yeah, it's okay to go back to the land. When in history, since perhaps the time of David, but when since the time of Isaiah, we'll put it that way, has Jerusalem ever been called the city of righteousness or the faithful city? Who, who in the last 2,700 years has called them that? Her neighbors today, even those with, with whom she has a, a, a tense treaty, non-aggression pact, Egypt, Jordan, the United States, her closest ally, Canada. We don't call Jerusalem the righteous city. The troubled city, the city that keeps us up all night. No one calls Jerusalem the faithful city. But one day people will, one day everyone will. One day when Israel reverses and instead of being backwards, walking away from God, turns toward God, runs toward God with all of her heart, soul, and mind and strength, confesses Jesus. When Jesus returns to rule and reign, everyone will say, you're the faithful city. As they join Israel in bowing down before him. And as Israel leads the world in worshiping Jesus the way they were taught. Okay, I'm still getting used to our format because it's after 6.30 and that was my target time for wrapping up. So I said aiming for 6.30, I'm going to promise 6.45. So let me, let me sprint for the finish here. This is new. We're going to get used to it together. And, it, it, and the problem is I set myself up because the first week in a new book, you got to do the thing with the context, right? And I thought, okay, did I just do the first week and it's all context? But no, we want to read the Bible. But, but time's getting away and I'm letting more time get away, talking about time getting away. So, so forgive me, I'm going to cut to the chase. Where are you in this passage tonight? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go there. Just, I'm just going to ask, where are you? Where are you? Don't, don't talk to me about the United States, because that's not this. Where are you? And, 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 and whatever the answer is, it's complicated. But it's worth asking the hard question and puzzling through the complicated answer because the story of Israel is our story. And it's complicated, but let's try. We were, everyone here, verse 4, sinful, evildoers, corruptors, provoking God to anger with our sin, rebelling against Him. Is there anyone here who wasn't that? Some of us, some of us more openly. Some of us very unapologetically. Others sneakily trying to conceal our wickedness with religion or philosophy some trying to to balance the evil we knew we were doing with good deeds and hope that at the end of the day the scales tipped in our favor that's everything israel was trying to do that's everything that israel was about as, as we headed down to verse 11. just like israel we were the players that deserved to be taken out of the game Every one of us. Because it's not like we didn't know what was right and wrong. We could, we could act all philosophical. Well, what is right? What is truth? Is there any truth? Come on. There's right and wrong, and we've all, always known that. And we needed to be taken out of the game for our sake, for the sake of others, for the sake of God's name. Because of God who is just, lets injustice go uncorrected, he denies himself. God can't do that. Except God said to us what he said to Israel, verse 18, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool if you're willing and obedient. Notice he doesn't tell Israel how it's going to happen because we haven't gotten to chapter 53 yet. Right now he's just saying it can happen. And he's saying they should let it happen. We know how it happens. Because we know that Jesus took the punishment that God describes in verses 30 and 31. Pause and consider that for a moment. The burning, the destruction that we deserved, Jesus took upon himself on the cross. And that's sobering. 
I don't think we think about that enough. We think about it every year around Good Friday and Easter, but it, it really, it should never be far from our minds. Jesus died. Well, you know, okay, bummer. Jesus was tortured. Yeah, I wish that hadn't happened. Jesus bore an eternity of burning wrath for everyone who has ever lived. If that doesn't give you pause, I don't know what will. Got to pause long enough to ask, have you said yes to that sacrifice? Have you said yes to Jesus' death on the cross? Have you let him take that burning, take that destruction upon himself in your place? I got to ask, and if you're not sure, can we talk after? But here on a Wednesday night, I'm going to assume for most of us the answer is yes. If you're not sure, seriously, let's talk. But if it's yes, assuming it's yes, the, the, the thought i got to end on is where are you tonight? Even on this side of verse 18. I, I asked where you were in the passage, but let me, let, me, let me drill down. Which side of verse 16 are you on? Let, let's assume that you're on the right side of verse 18. You've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've said, yeah, mercy sounds good to me. Forgiveness? Yeah, sign me up. But are you putting away evil? Are you learning to do good? Are you seeking justice? Are you rebuking tyranny? Are you defending orphans? Are you pleading for widows? Is that your purpose? Is that your character? Is that your ministry? Is that your life? I know you're saved. At least if you tell me you are, I'll believe you. You're God's children. But see, Israel was God's children. He says so in the opening verses. I get we're the bride of Christ, but Israel was the bride of Jehovah. And it didn't stop them from letting a form of religion replace the function of godliness in their lives. And being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you know this, doesn't keep the church from hiding behind tithes and sacrifices and songs and prayers ourselves. We have the same choice that Israel had. Are we loving our neighbor? Because that's what God is pointing them to. Hey, repent and be forgiven. And together we can go love people. Are we loving people? Because that's what we've been saved for. Patrick, are you saying I'm in danger of losing my salvation? No. A, no, and B, that's a different conversation. I'm saying even on this side of the cross, if you're not loving people, God will chasten you. If you're not stepping out in faith to serve people, God might put you on a shelf. If you're not being obedient with the ministry that, that God prepared for you before he laid the foundation of the world, he might take it away from you and give it to somebody who, who's, who's going to do it. But even if none of that was true, as we wrap up tonight, even if none of that was a danger, even if none of that was a threat, even if, if you could just keep going like you're going, and why would we want to go back to doing the same things that Jesus had to die for? Why would we go back to being lovers of self? People going through the motions. People not loving sacrificially. Why would we want to go back to blurring the lines between good and evil? That's what Jesus died for. Isn't going back to that the height of ingratitude? Isn't that the very first thing that God said about Israel? Wow, are they ungrateful. Where are you in this passage? We're going to be asking that question a lot as we make our way through Isaiah. And it's, I mean, it's always a good question when we're in Scripture. But some books, some books just compel it, and Isaiah's one. Because we're going to be tempted almost every week to say, Judah, <laughs> you knuckleheads, how do you not see it? How can you not get it? Do you not hear what God just said? How do you not respond? Almost every week, that that's going to be us. Which is why almost every week we're going to need to remind ourselves the story of Israel is our story. 
point a finger at Israel, we're pointing three right back at ourselves. Verses 16 and 17, one more time as we wrap up. And ladies, you can come on up. But verse 16 and 17, that's the gospel of Mark. That's not going to help us. <laughs> sure, toss your bookmark aside, Patrick. Botch the dramatic ending. Verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Put a circle around that. What is God saying to, to you and me tonight? What is he saying? He's saying, be the church. He's saying, be my children. Be my bride. Be my friends. Be the people I saved you to be. Lord, thank you for your word. Isaiah is so rich. And Lord, we, we're so looking forward to the things that you want to say to us through it. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd, you'd help me adapt to the new format and the new time frame. But we pray that, that, that those constraints wouldn't constrain you. The power of your spirit that's brought us here tonight and that's sending us home tonight with, with things to think about, things to pray about, things to ponder, things to apply. We love you, Jesus. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we will...